Dr. Kate Mangona began practicing as a board-certified pediatric radiologist in 2015 after completing a six-year medical program at the University of Missouri-Kansas City, radiology residency at Beaumont Health System in Royal Oak, Michigan, and pediatric radiology fellowship at Texas Children's Hospital in Houston, Texas. She's a supportive physician's wife and mother to three little girls and a mini poodle. She and her husband, Victor, a pediatric radiation oncologist and tax code enthusiast, are active and passive real estate investors in over 3,000 multifamily units and single-family rentals, including a luxury Airbnb, and lead a multifamily masterclass course where they teach others how to invest passively in real estate to grow their wealth as they sleep. As a certified life coach, Kate hosts the Medicine, Marriage, and Money podcast and leads the Medicine, Marriage, and Money coaching program where she helps married women physicians with children spend less time arguing with their spouse and more time reigniting the sparks once felt during their honeymoon. So we discussed the non-financial challenges that are specific to being in a dual physician couple. And then we get into the money, like double the student loans, managing that, talking to your spouse about money getting on the same page, their path to real estate investing, and handling three kids under four. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee, and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. It's story time, brought to you by locumstory.com. Today we'll be reading Docs in Shocks. Some docs are overworked as work works overworked workers weary. Some docs are overstocked, stopped as pandemic TikToks keep docs off clocks. If docs are in shock as the pandemic clock TikToks, then locums is the token to unburn the burnt out broken. So how many clock TikToks must talk until docs tick box and swaps to the spoken locum tenens token to unburn the burnt out broken? Enough ticks have talked. Time is now and locums is how. Locum tenens tends to trend as a godsend mend to burnt out ends. For more locum tenens information, Go to drpodcastnetwork.com slash locumstory is your final destination. Dr. Kate Mangona, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me, Dr. Block. <laughs> Brad, please. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about some non-financial challenges that are specific to a dual physician couple. What are, what are some challenges that you and Victor face? Oh, well, I mean, gosh, the biggest challenge is just scheduling right? Scheduling what they're taking care of the kids. Like who's going to take care of the kids when we're both working. And when are we going to schedule time to be together? Because when he's not working, I may be working on my podcast or we might be needing to do real estate stuff. So what is going to be that time we spend together? So what we've had to learn over the years is just to create a network of people we trust that we can help help, right? With our kids. Because well, we don't live in a city with my parents or his parents. So his parents live in Detroit. My parents live in Kansas City. We live in Dallas. So if we do want them to come down, you know, it has to be a little bit more planned out in advance. Although they have both come down with less than 24 hours notice. <laughs> they have both done that. And I think the reason is because our children are their only grandchildren. Oh. But yeah, I mean, scheduling, I think, is the hardest challenge. So then how do you do that? Like, for instance, childcare, is that solely his responsibility to decide and figure out who's going to be taking care of the kids? Is it solely your responsibility? And if not, how do you decide whose turn it is to sort things out? Okay. Well, we both picked our nanny out together. We both interviewed her together. We both wrote the, what we were looking for together. He wrote like this 80 question resume application process. So he was very involved in that. And that was about a year and a half ago. And before that we had no pair for a year and we were both very involved in picking our pair and like even our schools. So I think like we're both very involved in who's going to be taking care of them and which school we want to send them to or like how we want to educate them. But when it comes to like the day-to-day -day scheduling, it's me because I'm the one who has the more most flexibility with my job. I work three clinical days a week and one half admin day a week. And then my other, you know, day and a half, I schedule my meetings, my podcasting, my coaching sessions. And so I'm in charge of creating the schedule for our nanny every week. And she's super flexible. Like she knows she's going to come Tuesday, Thursday, Fridays, a certain block of time. 
but Mondays and Wednesdays, depending on my coaching schedule or appointments, I'll have her come at different times. And then I'm going to, if she's not available, text one of her three sisters. So she's got two sisters who routinely help us too, like on the weekends, because she prefers not to be the weekend. So I'm the one who kind of sets up the weekly schedule and makes sure that we schedule in time for me and Victor by having like a babysitter on a Saturday night or a Friday night. And it just works out because I'm kind of in charge of the calendar. <laughs> so you're jointly the CEOs and you're also the COO. So you're responsible for executing, but yeah. you both created the infrastructure. So what about scheduling dates? What does that look like? Oh, like by the seat of our pants, total last minute. Like I just put it on the calendar. So I will just, and there's definitely months where like my new, when we had our baby four months ago, where there was like a month, maybe we didn't do the date nights, maybe a month or two, but I just put it on the schedule. And I started doing this about two years ago. So every Saturday night or, you know, not every Saturday night, but most Saturday nights or one day a week, I'll just put it on there and find childcare. That's it. And then what we do that night, we'll either decide the second we're walking out the door or we, if there is something, you know, if it's, oh, we got to go see that Van Gogh exhibit. Okay. So then he'll get tickets earlier in the day. Or, you know, if it's something bigger, like a fundraiser party, we want to go to, we knew about that, like a couple of weeks or a month in advance. Okay. You know, but the point that I'm trying to make is you don't have to have plans in order to just put it on the calendar and get a babysitter. You can just figure things out. But you put it on the calendar. So you are the one who decides to put it on the calendar? Yes. Okay. So you're like, these are the times that we're going to be going on dates. And he's like, sure. I make it easy. I mean, I make it simple. It's like almost every Saturday night. Okay. But in terms of the delegation of responsibility... Deciding when the dates are going to happen is yours. I like how simple that is. Yes. So what? So a lot of what you talk about in your podcast, right? Financial. So one of the challenges that dual physicians might have, and not even dual physicians, but anyone who comes out with student loans, how do you manage dual student loans? How did you guys work that uh, out? <laughs> well, we refinance like every year. Victor loves to refinance, right? To just get our interest rate lower, as low as we can for certain. And honestly, so we decided when we got married, that we weren't going to be anxious about our student loans. And we weren't going to, it wasn't going to be one of those things we were going to just hate having. And we consider it, you know, our good debt, right? It provided us with an opportunity to become a physician. Without those loans, he probably would not have become a physician. I might have, but they helped me, right? So so just based on like whether our parents were willing to pay for or could pay for it or not. So it provided us with an opportunity. I just don't look at it as something I'm resentful for, I hate. And I know that our interest rates are low enough that what we invest in our real estate or you know our retirement funds is going to make more than the interest that's building up on our student loans. So we choose to just figure out well, you know, how can we create the most wealth with the time we have? It's not by paying out our, our student loans as fast as we can. So that is definitely not our goal. Not everyone thinks of it that way, but I know several people who do. That is what we have chosen because we just don't get all upset about it. Dave Ramsey's head just exploded. (laughs) Now, not to say, now when it comes to a car loan, you know, we don't have any car loans, right? We don't like to buy the $100,000 car where we have a car loan hoping over because those are high interest rates, right? So we choose to not have certain loans but mortgages, okay, you know, bring it on. Yeah, that's also with us. That's a way that we can manage our spending. If I can't pay for it with cash, I can't have it. When we renovated our house, we said, we're not going to take out some construction mortgage and then roll it into our mortgage, even though the interest rate on our mortgage is low. We could do that. And it might make financial sense even to do that. But it was, if we can't afford it and pay for it with cash, we're not going to do it. A lot of times for myself, I have to hide money from myself, right? So everything that I do has to be automated in order to prevent me from having access to that money to spend it. No, that's exactly what Victor and I do. We put, we don't even see our paychecks. They go directly into our Vanguard investment account. And when we need the money to pay the bills, we'll transfer it to our check. We'll transfer certain sums to our checking. (laughs) Exactly. So how did you guys talk about money? From the start, right? How did you get on the same page or at least the same chapter? 
maybe not even the same chapter. How do you get the same, make sure you're reading the same book or even in the same library? Okay, I'll stop with that analogy. But how do you start having that conversation and how do you make sure that you continue to be in the same place about money? No, that is such a good question because it's not like we didn't just start talking about money once a month or quarterly, just automatically. I think it's just a, it's a passion that Victor developed when, when we were both in fellowship, when we were still making fellowship, you know, salary. And he was like, well, we got to figure out what to do next year. Like, I didn't even, I didn't, I never even thought about it. I was always so focused on just training and learning the material and as was he, but in all of his free time, he would read books. He would go on Bogleheads. He would read all the blogs and the articles and start posting and sharing whatever he learned with the next person. So he became so passionate about it and he just kind of led the way. So like when we first started searching for a home, like we looked at million dollar homes. We looked at $200,000 homes. Like we, we looked at every option in between and what you could buy in Dallas and in the suburbs, in the city, what you could get for different things. And to be honest, I had like a hundred percent trust in what he does, but then he also was very open and transparent in everything in our financials. So like he would have me sit down and be like, look, like when I wanted to go part-time, I wanted to go from a hundred percent one FTE to 0.7 FTE. He sat down and we ran all the numbers together. He's like, this is how much we will not be bringing in, but look, this is how much goes to taxes anyway, you know? And so he just make helps. He sits down with me when I have a question and helps everything make sense. And like the same thing with real estate, he grew up in a real estate family. So he saw his parents every weekend going to go paint the house or you know, collect the trash or do whatever that needed to be done to upkeep their several different properties in Michigan. And that was just normal for him. And what he saw was that his mother didn't quite understand, like she was always maybe a little resentful or didn't really understand what the long-term effects was going to be until she was able to retire like 10 or 15 years earlier than she thought, because they had that steady stream of cash flow from their rental properties. And so he wanted me to understand exactly from the beginning why we were doing this. And so he just made it visible. He encouraged me to hang out with certain people. I I think that's what it is. We just started hanging out with other like-minded people who thought like him and who were as passionate about real estate and investing as he was. And once I clicked with certain people and became friends with them, you know, because there's only so much your spouse can teach you or, you know, teach only to so you. Only so much you're willing to listen to. Yes, exactly. You're only so much I'm willing to listen. And, but if I hang out with my good girlfriends now who are super passionate about the same things and building legacy and, and, and financial freedom, then I'm like, oh my God, yes, I'm totally on board because I'm seeing what's creating for them. And I want the same thing for us. I love that. I have to go out and make more friends. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> that is what it is, Bradley. You have to make new friends. Not that you have to get rid of your old friends, right? No, I every- have to get rid of my old friends. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Eric, I know you listen to this. I love you, but I'm sorry. I have to find some real estate friends. This is what you end up talking about. And they get excited about it, which gets you excited about it. And yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Which is why your network is your net worth. I'm sorry. Say, oh, your network is your net worth. Yep. The, uh, yeah, the other saying is you're the average of the of your five closest friends. Yep. Yeah, they definitely have a big influence on you. So I apologize. This is not a question that I had prepared you for, that I'd sent to you. But how many episodes do you have so far on your podcast? 59. 50. Wow. Wow. Give us one or two actionable pieces of advice that you've learned from your guests. And so in 59 episodes, one or two real gems that you've learned from your guests? Okay. Oh my gosh. There's like a hundred different gems. Okay. One of my favorites is one of my first and my first uh, month of podcasting, somebody related an, a vending machine, like to your spouse, like, are you using your spouse as an emotional vending machine? And like, I had all these light bulbs go off. I'm like, oh my God, you're right, right? Like sometimes am I going to my spouse because I want to feel loved or because I want to feel appreciated or because I want to be happy. And am I treating them like an emotional vending machine? You know, I come home and they may be stressed. So then I become stressed too. Or, you know, maybe he will get irritated or angry and then I get irritated, angry too. So it's like, and then 
whatever I'm seeing, I project. So then I'm like, okay, really it's about taking ownership for your own feelings and you can still be there for your spouse. But if I want to feel loved, then how can I create that for myself? And then I realized, okay, well then I just have to be more loving or more, more acceptance to the love that already exists instead of feeling or, and asking myself, why do I feel unloved? Right? Why do I feel unappreciated? Well, it's not because of anything that my friend or my spouse or my kids are saying or doing or not saying or not doing. It's because of what I'm thinking about those things. So it's like really digging down deep into your thoughts and not just taking things as an emotional vending machine surface level. That was like a very good point. I mean, you were on my podcast recently (laughs) and you said, don't keep score. That's what I learned about two years ago. And I still have to remind myself sometimes. I'm like, oh, well, I took care of the kids tonight and yesterday and so that you should take care of the kids tomorrow. It's like, no, what's our big picture? What's our goal here? We, we're, we're a couple. We are a team. We have the same vision and the same end game. So however that happens in the middle, it's, it's just us figuring it out and, and enjoying, like, how can we just enjoy life, the journey? Because then there's that arrival fallacy. Okay. And I will say one more thing. Okay. One more thing I learned is some guests have come on and talked about femininity and masculinity. And I think my podcast speaks a lot to female physicians and we have, we tend to be very career driven, very outspoken, very opinionated, maybe stubborn. And when we show up that way at work, when we come home, it's hard to turn that switch off. But when we first fell in love, If we are more feminine, not that all females are, some females are more masculine and some are more feminine, but if you have that more feminine vibe and that's how you showed up when you first met your spouse and fell in love with your spouse, that's what they love about you. They love that light, that air, that carefree type of vibe. And so when you stop showing up that way, and it can happen very slowly over time, once you have kids, once you get the career, once you've got all these responsibilities, you know, got to pay the bills, manage the house. It's hard to see unless you step outside yourself and look, am I showing up as that fun person that I want to be around? Because if you don't want to be around yourself, why does your spouse want to be around you? Otherwise it's bait and switch, right? <laughs> you were this one person and then switch. Yeah. Uh, not fair. Not fair. No bait and switch. No, that's a good point. That's something that male physicians don't have to contend with, right? Like there's another, yet another challenge that I haven't heard about before that physician, female physicians have to contend with. Yeah. That's right. Because for men, it's the same when you come home, go to work. Very similar. Okay. So we both have three kids and up until a few weeks ago, you had three kids under four. Two years ago, I had, uh, no, less than that. I had three kids under four. So we both had, you have three girls. I have three boys. Would you recommend having three kids under four to other people? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it is just the best. And, you know, I am fortunate because I did have to, I did, I do have PCOS. So I had to take some medication in order to have the first two kids. And then the last kid, she just came. So it does, it cannot happen for everybody. I realize that, but if you can, then just do it. It is so fun to watch them interact. And okay, so do it and ask for help. Do it and ask for have three kids under four and ask for help. You've got to learn that. And I think once by the time you do have three kids, you're kind of like asking for all the help you can get. Whereas on your first kid, you're like, oh, I can do this all myself. Like I don't really need, like I want to spend all the time with my baby. And that may be true. But then once they become a toddler, maybe things might change, right? Things might become more difficult. It depends on how you look at the baby versus the toddler versus the the teenager. So I asked for all the help. I just couldn't see it any other way. And to be honest, I don't even know if I'm done. Don't tell Victor, Hmm. but I know I just, I love babies. And honestly, they're just like, 
they have been, they have given me more than what I have actually given them. I like to tell this to people. I read a lot of, or parent, I read a lot of like parenting advice type books or actually listen to them like Audible. Like, yeah, um, yeah, I'm the same way. I consume everything by, it's like Audible. I'm illiterate now. Everything yes, is yes. audio. <laughs> I down, I'll fall asleep to read a book. So like conscious parenting, it's really all about how the child is influencing your life. And actually it's creating you to grow as a person. And you're just there as their guide. Right? Like we can't tell our children what kind of personalities to have. We really can't even tell them what to do when they grow up. And they, if they want to be successful, they even get to design, they get to design what successful means to them and looks like to them. And these are all things I've, I'm still learning. <laughs> so that's what's so wonderful about having the three kids under four. Oh, yes. What yes. is the biggest challenge of having oh my gosh. three kids so close together? Ah, the biggest challenge is that it can feel like a lot. I mean, two months ago, I had a newborn. I had a four-year-old who sometimes, well, she vomits. She used to be an emotional vomiter. And so she has a very sensitive gag reflex. She gagged on some salmon skin. I was forcing her, trying to get her to eat healthy. And so I have to get in my own, out of my own head, right? When I try to get my kids healthy. She gagged on the salmon skin that I was having her to eat vomiting everywhere. I mean, it just doesn't stop. When she starts vomiting, it doesn't stop. The newborn is crying because she needs to be fed. The dog is running around eating up all the vomit, like getting it all over her paws. Less to clean up. Less to clean up, but then it's all over her fur, all over the carp, you know, getting on the carpet. I'm going to vomit just hearing this. Then the two-year-old, so that's the four-year-old vomiting, the newborn wanting to eat. Then the two-year-old is freaking scared out of her mind because she doesn't often see her sister projectile vomit like this over and over again. So she's crying. And then don't forget about like me, the mom, I'm freaking out too, like, what do I need here? You know, I had no help. I had no help. The nanny had just gone home. Victor was still traveling home from work, or maybe he was actually still seeing a patient at that time. So it's like, what do you do first? Do you clean up the vomit? Do you feed the newborn? Do you take the four-year-old into the bathtub? Or do you console the two-year-old child? And then what? Yeah, the fifth person, me. Or do I just sit down and have a glass of sparkling water? Slash <laughs> spritzer. <laughs> That's when it gets hard. Yeah, I think one good mantra to say to yourself in this situation is, at some point, this will be over. This awful scenario where everybody's just out of control. At one point, like they'll all be in bed, they'll all be sleeping, and this will be everything will be cleaned up, and it'll all be over. But yeah, I think that's something that medicine prepares us for. Also, is triage, right? Like we're good at picking up what's the first priority, what needs to happen first. But yeah, in those moments, it can get really overwhelming. Yeah. For, I, have a, I have a vomit story. My One of my kids, in order to protect their anonymity, I won't say which one it is, but he vomits at the sight of things. So the oldest one would vomit all the time. He was like a spit up kid. So okay. like spitting up and vomiting. And the, the middle one would never vomit. Everything you fed him, he held on to. Great. But if he sees something gross, he throws up. So the youngest one had been eating a banana and like smeared a little bit of it on the couch and it looked like vomit. So the middle one saw it and just starts going. And there was another time where the oldest, thankfully this, well, this was, we were both home, but the oldest had thrown up because he was sick. He's got asthma. So he has a couple of times where he had, you know, post-tussive emesis. So he threw up all over my wife. The middle one gets out of bed, walks into the room, sees my wife covered in vomit. He starts vomiting. <laughs> so it's just, and then that the wakes the baby up who's still in the crib. So the baby's cry. Like it, it was, yeah. So bedlam. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of vomit. A lot of vomit. <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking the time with your full-time job, your podcast, your coaching, your children, finding the time to to spend some time with us. Thank you so much for doing it. Where can people find you and where can people find your podcast? Yeah, so medicine, marriage, and money. Medicine, it, medicine because I became a doctor, then I got married, then I started making money. So medicine, marriage, and money uh, is a podcast that you can listen to. And I've got yeah 59 episodes now, t- t- full of ton advice about how to stop fighting with your spouse and loving more and setting those systems in place so that you guys can invest smart, smarter, be more financially savvy. And I do have a, uh, a free guide, a medical marriage survival guide for physicians in love. So you can download that on my website, medicinemarriageandmoney.com. Dr. Kate Mandagona, thank you so much. Thank you. 
For doctors, the story has changed. Visit drpodcastnetwork.com slash locum story for unbiased information about locum tenens and see if it should be your next chapter. And remember, locum tenens tends to trend as a godsend mend to burnt out ends. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.